Before you can create a healthy relationship with others, you first have to create a healthy relationship with yourself. Welcome to Let's Talk About It with your host, Dr. Janie Lacey. Janie is a nationally respected psychotherapist, and on this show, she and her featured guests will help you discover and break patterns in your life that can contribute to self-sabotage and unhealthy relationships. Now, here is Dr. Janie Lacey. Another episode of Let's Talk About It with Janie Lacey. You know, sometimes it seems as if the world is just full of selfish people who have no thought for others except how to use them for their own purposes. Their needs are more important than anyone else's and they expect to be accommodated in all things. They can't seem to see the bigger picture or to comprehend why they might not always come first. Their expectations have almost a childlike quality. Often we give in to them because it seems safer to not rock their boat, yet they don't mind rocking ours. <laughs> we all know people like this. We sense that something is wrong, but we can't quite put our finger on what it is. We are most affected in our intimate relationships with friendships, lovers, and family that give life its richness and meaning. By its very nature, this sickness, we'll call it, isolates us from one another and from reality. And it stands between us and all that we can hope to have and be. Its name is narcissism. <laughs> I cannot think of another credible, reputable male relationship expert other than Stefanos Stefandos. We're going to just call him Steph. Beautiful name. It is with distinct pleasure I welcome you to the show, Steph. Oh, thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Movies and television shows such as American Psycho, Basic Instinct, Gone Girl, and Big Little Lies, just to name a few, entertain us with the main characters with narcissistic personality disorders. But if you have been in a relationship with someone with narcissistic traits, it's no laughing matter. <laughs> so we're bringing you nothing but everything that you need to know tonight about narcissism. And in particular, we're going to be focusing on, because we have relationship expert Steph here to help us break it down, in particular, around the male narcissistic characteristic traits for women. So I'm just going to kick it off with you, Steph. I mean, what would be some clues that someone is in a relationship with a person that has narcissistic traits that will make it a challenge to be in a healthy relationship with them. Yeah, so there's, there's no official criteria for NPD or narcissistic personality disorder. And we, we'll go through, I'll go through those briefly, but it's, it's really when you're with a narcissist, it's, it's what's the combination of these traits that are coming up on a frequent basis, on a regular basis, they're consistent, you're noticing these. And this is what the important part of Am I with someone that is a narcissist or am I with someone that carries strong narcissistic behavior? So we're looking at um, the official criteria. It's this grandiose sense of self-importance. They prioritize themselves over everyone else. There's even some, there can even sometimes be this, this, this illusion that their importance, their sense of self-worth trumps everybody else's. There's this preoccupation and of, of fantasies of success and power and um, autonomy and sovereignty and brilliance and beauty and these idealistic values that they have and that they have this belief that they're special and unique um, and can only be understood by or should associate with other elite people in their class. And you can see this leak out in their conversations, in who they're spending time with, in what they're speaking about often. So you can be mindful about that. Is, is where are they placing themselves in terms of the, in comparison to the echelons of society? Narcissists will have this need for excessive admiration. They need to be seen. And when they're not, they fall apart. They really do. They have a sense of entitlement or it can be known as, in more colloquial terms, this chip on the shoulder. Um, that can be something that's very obvious as well. It's, it's like when something goes wrong, they, they get flustered, they get upset. Well, that shouldn't happen to me. I deserve better. And so dealing with difficulty can be very, very 
challenging as well for someone with narcissistic personality disorder or someone that carries strong narcissistic traits. Um, they exploit other people. So hyper selfish, they leverage, um, they leverage the weakness or uh, sensitivities or kindness of other people as well. They lack empathy and compassion very difficult to connect to how other people are feeling. There's almost this blankness, this staring over of, I can't even connect to your pain right now. And they, they legitimately sincerely can't. Um, they have a envy of others and they believe that others envy them. And so jealousy is a very strong characteristic with a narcissist. And the final, um, you know, the, the final nine official criteria is this, this arrogance and, uh, haughty behaviors or attitude in, in life. It's this, I'm better than, and they're the, they're the nine um, official characteristics or criteria rather, but we can, we can go a little deeper if you want. Well, thank you so much for many. breaking that down. Yes, yeah, so there, <laughs> yeah. there are many, I'm sure as people are listening or watching, they can relate with some of those. Mm. And you know, you said something about that they cannot or have difficulty connecting with the pain of others. And mm. when I think about that, I would think about that there probably are certain kinds of personalities that are more vulnerable to being attracted to a narcissistic personality or someone that, that has traits. Could you share with us some of your expertise on the types of people who a narcissist would be attracted to or the types of people who would be attracted to a narcissist? Yeah, so most people with, with NPD wanna feel good about themselves and they'll do anything to feel good about themselves. And so they'll gravitate towards people that ultimately will make that happen. So either they will feel special through association, we spoke about that as part of the nine criteria, or they'll feel very powerful in taking someone down, in hurting others, in being, uh, in overpowering others, in being um, overbearing in their actions. That, they'll, that someone who appears mentally, physically, or emotionally strong, even they want to take them down, or someone that's weak. So people pleasers, people that when I say weak, people that they don't have, they lack that self-confidence. They don't believe in themselves. They don't have that heightened sense of self-worth. They can taught themselves to make others happy. So narcissists will be attracted to, to those types of people. And ultimately there are four types of people who narcissists tend to be attracted to. So people who are impressive in some way, shape or form, because they want to associate with that. So they're going to, they're going to be attracted to these personalities because they want what they have and they'll do, anything to, to take it. Um, they, they want to be with people who are constantly complimenting them. So people that look up to them, they're going to attract those types of people. Um, they're going to attract people that are popular and socially advanced, people that are in the media, people that are looked upon really well. And they're going to attract people that validate their feelings. That's an important part as well. They want to be validated. They want to be seen as a narcissist. You, you want to be feeling very, very special. Um, and someone that essentially, you know, is part of that, they're, they're not going to leave them. They're going to be almost attached to them and desperate for their, their, their energy. So they're attracting wounded people, people that haven't resolved their childhood issues, people that haven't resolved their trauma, people that feel they need other people to function and be of value in the world. So a word that comes to mind as I hear you describe the types of people that would probably be attracted to a narcissistic personality, the word codependency comes to mind where you're cold, but you give someone else a sweater, especially if they need the admiration. Mm. Is yeah, that right? 100%. So codependency, we're far from interdependency here, from healthy interdependency. We're in codependency where basically I'm going to contort myself to make you happy even if I sacrifice my needs. And I'm just going to keep doing that, building resentment, yet also being addicted to what your needs are. Addicted. It's a, a, a very um, relevant word when we're talking about the narcissistic yeah. empath relationship in particular. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think about the term love bombing, especially when it comes to people that would meet a narcissist and they have some type of void because of their codependency. Mm -hmm. And the love bombing, um, you know, I would want you to speak a little bit about that because I imagine that that has a lot to do with how might we miss a narcissist. So if a female is listening to this mm -hmm. and she's thinking about her own recovery, her own healing, and she's thinking about how did I miss this? I mean, what would be some of your tips or thoughts around um, how we might miss a narcissist? They're super charming and they're super believable. 
And that makes it difficult to not spot a narcissist. And when I say they're super believable, they're going to say anything and everything they can to get what they want. And so there's lies and manipulation there. And because they believe generally their own lies and their own manipulative ways, it becomes very difficult to spot a narcissist. Gaslighting is a part of that as well. And so you, you end up thinking, oh, maybe I'm at fault. Maybe it's me. Maybe I need to make the adjustments. Because is that that reversal of, oh, what I'm seeing here maybe isn't happening. And narcissists can be very convincing of that. You know, they'll feed you compliment after compliment after compliment and make you feel better about yourself as well. And so that, that makes it very, very difficult to spot. Something that most people don't look at, and I, and I started thinking about this probably in the last few months, is... See, most narcissists don't have long-term friends, right? And, and so you think about that, well, that's a warning sign sort of, isn't it? Because if you can't sustain long-term friendships, isn't that an indication of your ability to be trustworthy and reliable and in integrity and so forth? And one may say, yes, but here's the thing. Because they don't maintain long-term friendships, like any relationship, when you first meet or any relationship that's novel and new, there's this honeymoon period. It's called the limerence phase, right? Where the hormones are high, whether it's a romantic partnership or a friendship. And so there's this almost this closeness that comes. And so when in, you ask in the, the example of a female, when a female meets the narcissist's friends, she observes, oh, he's really close with his friends. He's joyful. There's fun there because they're in the hormonal stage, the limerence phase of meeting each other as friends. And so there's an illusion that, oh, he's actually got close friends. And so we don't think to say, oh, how long have you been friends for? Or, or we, just, we, we just admire the connection itself. And that can be something that we miss as well. And, you know, another thing, they, you know, I want to come back to the gaslighting part because you're constantly worried about you. You're feeling anxious. You're often apologizing to them. You're making them the hero. You're wondering, oh, am I being too sensitive? Am I making mistakes? You're losing your confidence. And so you become reliant on them. So you miss how they are behaving because you are internalizing how they are actually behaving. And what I also hear in that stuff is, is they can be popular. So if they're popular, we can have the illusion that they mm. have are well known or well respected mm. or well liked. And, and I know sometimes when you kind of drill down in some of that, sometimes the popularity are people who will come around them, but don't really know them. Mm. So then when, when that ha kind of happens, you know, I'm wondering, I like to use this term and I'm wondering your thoughts about, about it is, is how do narcissists then use stealth control? So in a romantic relationship, you know, they, they, you now see they're popular, they, they charmed you, they love bombed you, and now you're hooked and you're attached. So what are your thoughts about that stealth control for, for women that are listening or watching? Well, it's, it's manipulation. So they're not going to ask for things directly. You know, that's, a, that's an important part. And you'll almost be in a position of overthinking um, and you're always going to be in a position of being dependent on them as well. Um, that they will manipulate events and situations. They'll manipulate memories and, or, or situations that happen. And it's, it's that, that stealth control. It's all, it's all really around gaslighting. For me, that's how I see it. That's how I see it. It's that, it's that gaslighting, oh, no, that, that didn't happen that way. Or they'll, they'll say yes, then they'll say no. They'll say yes, then they'll say no. Maybe it's going to an event or going to dinner or they'll ask you to choose and then they'll be upset at you for choosing and claim that, that you didn't give them the opportunity to be autonomous or sovereign in the decision-making. They'll make you feel bad. And then what's happening is they're controlling your emotional well-being and how you feel about yourself and how you feel about them as well. And so now you're indebted to them. They'll sometimes narcissists will go into, because it resides on a spectrum. There's no one way of being with narcissistic personality disorder. Maybe they'll go above and beyond for you and they'll hold that in credit. Well, I did this for you and I did that for you. But again, they'll prey on people that are susceptible to that people that are people pleasers, people that feel guilt and shame and harbor that within themselves. And a narcissist can pick up on that because a narcissist is so hurt himself or herself. 
So you said people pleasing. <laughs> so I yeah. think it would be um, it would uh, be important for us to kind of break that down a little bit because I think a lot of people can relate with the people pleasing aspect about doing for others and they find that they get their worth through that. So in what ways could that be an unhealthy trait where that makes them prey to the narcissistic uh, male in particular for looking at the female? Well, in people pleasing, we're losing ourselves. We're losing the sense of who we are. We're losing our identity. We're wrapping up our self-worth, our happiness, our sense of joy, basically any, any emotional state in how others are perceiving us, treating us, or how they feel about us. And so that's a, that's a lose-lose game when we're talking about the game or parts of the game of life. And, and what we also understand with people, well, most of the time we don't understand with people pleasing is it's actually quite selfish. And you think, well, hold on a second, people pleasing is all about giving. Well, yeah, it is, but it's giving in order to feel some sense of self-worth. Oh, I feel good now. But that's very short-lived. And so we have to give again. So there's more contortion, there's more resentment. And particularly people with power, because we perceive them, if they have power, if they have this grace, this social, um, if they're a social icon, then I can feel better about myself giving to them. And if they're, if they're so important and they're on this hierarchy, they're on this pedestal and I'm giving to them and I'm doing for them, then I'm going to feel so much better about myself. And we get lost in that game. So if we look at what a healthy relationship should be, basically it sounds like it should be a tennis match. It should be mutuality that you give to each other um, and not a one-sided relationship where you're just giving, 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 which can be a... Um, clue to being in that unhealthy narcissistic empathic type relationship yeah I, I very much agree with that i think it's a reciprocal reverence that we share for each other we're able to give and we give from a place of heart with no rigid expectation of something in return and we're also able to receive when someone does something for us whether it's a gift or a gesture or uh, a form of an expression of adoration we're able to receive that openly because we believe we are worthy of that and, but that requires, Jenny, you know that, that requires deep inner child work and shadow work and understanding how we've grown during our developmental years, how we've learned to give and receive love, how we see and view ourselves. How, do we shame our bodies? Do we shame our minds? Do we, what's our self-talk? Is that harsh and rigid? And all of this requires effort and work, of course. And when someone doesn't do their work, then um, what I'll see, especially when it comes to the narcissistic type relationship, it's real easy in that people pleasing personality to give the narcissist their playbook. <laughs> they give them everything that they know about them because there's a lack of self-awareness and they're still operating underneath that veil of, of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So then with, with, with that being said, with that playbook, you know, could you talk a little bit about the twin fantasy uh, in that term um, when we look at narcissistic relationships and why females in particular need to know about that twin fantasy and how they get swept into that whole, um, I found the one in the soulmate and with a narcissist, how that probably is not necessarily the case. Um, and in that sense, that twin fantasy is about or we're alike, we're very similar. And so we all want to be in the in-group. This is an evolutionary thing. We don't want to be in the out-group because once upon a time, hundreds of thousands of years ago, millions of years ago, even thousands of years ago, in a very volatile environment with apex predators far bigger than us, we, it really was a strength in numbers game. And so if you're, out, if you're in the out-group or you're part of the out-group, you're probably going to die fairly quickly. Now, from a neurological perspective, that's ingrained within us that there is a strength in numbers. We're going to survive when we're together. And so because of that, we all want to surround ourselves. We often want to surround ourselves. Yes, difference attracts and similarities. Uh, I, we retain relationships through similarities as well. And so that, that twin fantasy is that narcissist projecting his fantasy of, oh, if we're alike, then I'm like you. And if I idolize you, then I get to be like you. Then people are going to idolize me as well. And it works in reverse too, in order to manipulate that individual. So as far as I understand the twin fantasy concept is that that individual, that man is going to, in this case, man, woman, that man is going to project, oh, we're very similar. Very, very, we are very similar. And then the woman feels safe. And then he manipulates. And then he has control. 
Exactly. So, you know, what I, what I would add to that is um, there's also this part where they can study you. So they learn yes. what you like, they learn, you know, they're watching you and sometimes they can, um, in their mind, there are a few chapters in. So they've learned about you and they learned to kind of seen how you move. So then when they come upon you, they kind of mirror back to you what they think you want or what you think you like mm. you know so if someone doesn't want to have kids and they find out that they don't you don't want to have kids and so then they'll kind of present to you well you know I don't want to necessarily have kids and you're thinking wow you know this is my match so then you get to that place of well I met my soulmate so when I'm working with women that are in recovery from working with um from being with a narcissist that's what they'll say you know Steph is I thought I met my soulmate he was perfect yeah. he had everything that I ever um wanted and they kind of get into that into that fantasy of it and that's where I go back to in the beginning that that love bombing they're they're showering you they're all about you and if you have not done your inner child work if you haven't done your work they're going to fulfill that void you know especially if you have that hero fantasy someone's going to come in and rescue me and they just come in and, and do that and i think about that that scene from gone girl where where nick kind of meets amy and they're meeting in the bar and nick says to amy i'm going to be the one who um rest pretty much rescues you when she asks who you are mm -hmm. and it's kind of like that embodies that fantasy and amy was just taken with nick and then woof off to the um to the to the races the gone girl is like yeah. love addiction on steroids <laughs> yeah so then so then what do narcissists want when they when we talk about that scene with nick and amy and gone girl so what do narcissists want when they first meet a love interest how can you educate the women um that are going to be listening to this or watching mm -hmm. Well, I remember reading um, uh, Dr. Eleanor Gren Grenberg or Greenberg, uh, PhD, saying something around, about this, about the three types of narcissists. And there's the exhibitionist narcissist who wants to be admired. So that's what they're really going to want when they, that love interest is spiked. The, it's the, there's the closet narcissist who wants to be associated with someone whom they admire. We've spoken a little bit to that, right? someone that they put in a pedestal and so forth. And then there's a toxic narcissist who wants to dominate and make another person feel worthless. And this is what we spoke about, about the spectrum. There's not just one type of narcissist. And so generally when a narcissist meets a love interest, it's more than likely going to fall under these three categories. So where does the, uh, the whole flying monkey comes into play when they kind of use other people to bid their position to kind of create that, um, that position for the person who let's kind of identifies the the empath where where would you have seen that kind of play out when they kind of use other people to bid who they are and to kind of uh vet them so then that person now has all these people around them who see something in this narcissistic personality mm. so kind of creates this confusion for them look look for that individual feeling nervous about themselves look for that individual having low self-worth and doubt about themselves and then he he needs others to vouch for him he needs others to validate him as well and to prove that he's something of substance it also can be part of that manipulation track sometimes it's conscious sometimes it's unconscious in terms of the thought out plan of that um, but it can also be just, again, more credibility means more validation, means more worth, means a higher chance that that narcissist can control the situation. So then you made a comment earlier about the, um, the inner child work. So when we kind of yeah. look at a narcissist in particular, if we kind of go back to the development of the narcissistic personality, I mean, what would be some of the things that you've seen in your work with, with men to kind of um, create that type of trait or personality? Oh, a great deal of neglect from, um, from parents, from primary caregivers. So we're talking about, um, we're talking about abuse as well. Right, deep, deep abuse. We're also talking about an inflation of the ego and inflation of the self. So we're talking about that individual as a child being made to be a God, basically. That's also part of it too. Often it more so, and again, you know, the, when we look at the science behind this, we're looking at um, potentially physiological issues happening in the brain. And that's why many would say that NPD is not, it's not reversible. I don't know if I completely agree with that. And, I, and I, I've done a lot of research. Have I done enough? I'm not sure. It's, 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 the jury's out on that, right? And maybe, I don't know, we can go into that conversation, but that's a tough one. But people that have experienced a great deal of abuse, bullying, that have lost their power as children, that their power has been taken away from them, 
Um, again, that sexual abuse, physical abuse, deep emotional abuse, being told that they're not good enough over and over again, low, low self-worth. Um, and they're just really trying to claim their power back and they'll go, human nature says that we'll, we'll go to extremes to be able to do that. Um, and again, the other end of the spectrum is that inflation of ego. Uh, and whenever that's threatened or questioned, the narcissist or the, the developing narcissist will dig those heels in and go back to what mum and dad said or go back to what he or she were taught about how good they are. So there's, there's, it comes from really a lot of wounding, a lot of pain. So then uh, you mentioned, and I don't know if you can make a comment in the, um, a few minutes, but yeah. what, what is your thought about can a narcissist change or someone that has narcissistic traits? I mean, what would be some of the key elements that you've seen with your work with men that's created a certain change where they can move from that toxic relational mm. dynamic to a healthier one? I think it depends how deep into NPD they are or how deep into the narcissistic traits that they hold are. But the key ingredient, and this is very difficult for a narcissist, is self-awareness. That, that's where it starts. And, and, and most narcissists, they can't see the forest through the trees. And so what do most people need to experience? Enough pain to change and to realize that, wow, I've really hurt all these people. But then, you know, we're, we're talking about them slipstreaming into empathy. And probably the only way to get there is for them to feel immense personal pain themselves that they can then relate to others to some degree. And then some level of change can begin to transpire. So that's the quickest way I could probably answer that in a couple of minutes. Sure. So, so it's like self-awareness is the, is the huge piece. And, and I would um, imagine also a willingness to want to do the inner Correct. work. And that willingness says, you know what, I, there, there's, there's other things that I can, or curiosity would be the word that I would use, Steph. There's curiosity about the self. Mm. And there would be that way to be able to, because if there's curiosity, then there's a way to, to now want to unpack why I am the way that I am. Let me look at, not to blame my childhood, but let me understand what was developed inside of me that I could be recreating certain traumas um, in yeah. particular. I feel that curiosity, and I completely agree with you. I feel the curiosity, the exploration, the willingness, for me, from what I've witnessed in men in my experience, it comes from immense, them experiencing immense pain and immense loss. And not to the point where they dig their heels in or dig their, their feet in and say, right, I'm done. I'm going to hurt others now so I never get hurt. But to the point where there's a surrender. So they go, they'll go one of two ways. When they surrender into the pain, then shift and transformation is possible. Surrender. I love that word. So what would it look like in a practical sense for, for a man to surrender? What does that mean? To seek help, to seek help, to say, I, I can't do this alone. I need help. Counseling, men's groups, psychologists, psychotherapists, shamans, spiritual healers, guides, whatever, a coach, whatever it may be. So I can't do this on my own. That, that's a, a very practical, pragmatic step for a man to take um, in, in wanting to transform himself. Wow. So you broke down what a narcissist is and you broke down um, why we miss a narcissist. And then what are some of those things that um, we can look at for, for that type of personality so that people can educate themselves. So um, when we come back, I have some more questions for our guest, uh, Steph, who is breaking it down for us ladies about all about narcissistic personality traits and being in a relationship with one. So we will be right back with Let's Talk About It with Janie Lacey with our guest, Steph, relationship expert. And I will consider one of the experts on uh, men personalities who I trust. And he is joining us today with Let's Talk About It with Janie Lacey. We'll be right back after this commercial break. Are you often attracted to unavailable partners? Feel like you can't stay but can't leave a toxic relationship? Obsessed with thinking about a current or former lover? Feel resentful that you're always taking care of the other person? The Woman Redeemed Therapy Program is for women who want to break free from toxic relationship patterns so they can find the love they truly deserve. This program is a safe, nurturing environment, essential for building self-worth and acquiring the tools to work through challenges and create your best self. We invite you to begin the journey today to start building the new you. Call 407-622-1770 or visit LifeCounselingSolutions.com. That's LifeCounselingSolutions.com. You are listening to Let's Talk About It with Dr. Janie Lacey. To reach the show today, please call into 1-888-346-9141. 
That's 1-888-346-9141. You may also send an email to Janie at lifecounselingsolutions.com. Now back to Let's Talk About It. Let's talk about it with Janie Lacey with our special guest, guest Steph, who is breaking down narcissism for all of our ladies who are tuning in and who want to know and unpack the relationships that they may have experienced. But I want to take a quick um, turn here, Steph, and I'm wondering for you, what has been the top three areas of concern that people have been sharing and what's been about what's been keeping them up at night uh, during these challenging times? What have you seen? Oh. I'm going to condense, condense it's only three. <laughs> um, look, definitely fear and worry about um, health, you know, one's own health and health of loved ones and uh, financial situations, job loss, job security. Um, the, uh, a lot of fear around uncertainty. What's next? What does the world look like? What does it feel like? Um, where do we go from here? Love has been a, a real big challenge for people as well because people ha- are having this fear around connecting. Am I connecting with someone safe? Who have they been mixing with? They have, do they have uh, COVID in some capacity? Um, is it dormant within them? What is it? People are really scared about this. So people that are dating singles, uh, there's trepidation around and concern around, oh, I want to be with someone and I have apprehension and fear around it. So there's some of the big big things, you know, and for families particularly is homeschooling and just having their children be with friends. They want their children to be social and they're torn. And that's a, that's a big thing for parents as well. And kids, kids are suffering because they want to be with other kids. They want to play that most children don't really understand what's going on per se, but, and there's some limitations there. So that's, that's been pretty tough for people, you know? Yep, I totally agree with that stuff because during this time, I've become a uh, a teacher, a homeschool oh. teacher, which I never mm. thought I would would be. Wow! And you know, a, a funny joke about that. My son had said to me one day. He said, "You are the best teacher I've ever had." And I said, "Rylan, oh. well, why is that?" And you want to know why stuff? He said, "Because you've been so lenient." <laughs> It wasn't necessarily a good thing, but absolutely. I mean, families, the, the, the schedules and the things that we were used to just kind of uh, were, were changing. We had to make some adjustments, but I also see that there's been also outside of the fear and all those things, there's been some beauty that have come mm-hmm. from these times as well. And that's more togetherness yeah. and um, checking on our elders and those people who um, we may be at a distance, but it, it is different because my son is an only child. So he's been having Zoom meet and greets, <laughs> Who would have ever thought. Wow. <laughs> But, um, you know, I want to go back to to just talking about toxic relationships and just been, um, especially with the narcissistic imp- empath type personalities. I mean, so what are your thoughts with, do you really know your mate? You know, because inquiring minds really w- would like to know this. So these are the questions that I get. Is what secrets that men are hiding that they don't want women to know and, and why exactly? What are your thoughts about the secrets that men keep and why they keep them? It's a great question. So men are going to keep secrets for two reasons. Well, two two core, well, not two reasons, but a few different reasons. So let's look at that. The first is let's stay with where we were for a moment around a man that carries narcissistic personality disorder. So he's going to keep secrets to manipulate. Okay. What we don't often look at, look at with men is men keep secrets because they're scared. They're scared of rejection. They're scared of humiliation. These are core fears that are not only within men, but within all people, but particularly men. Rejection, humiliation, um, judgment. They don't want to be judged. And so there's a fear around that. There's shame. Men internalize shame massively. They make, they make themselves wrong because a man's worth is very much connected to status and how he's perceived. Whereas, a, and this is, there's evolutionary links to this, and a female's worth and worthiness to the world is, is more tied to her beauty and aesthetic and her, her nurturing, uh, the nurturing aspects of herself, her care and compassion. And so, again, this is generally speaking, of course, men, men, some men carry self worth in their aesthetics as well, 100%, and vice versa for women, but just generally speaking. And so, because men tie so much of who they are and their value and worth in their status, they'll hide certain things. So this is a great question. And in no particular order. So financial secrets are very common amongst first dating and meeting and, and, and so forth. Men are embarrassed. If I'm not making enough, what is she going to think of me? 
And the other side of that is, well, if I make quite a lot, is she going to take it from me? Men have these irrational fears as well. And it's not, it's, you know, it's, it's amplified in our culture, in our media, in, in the litigious society, particularly in America that we live in. So that, that's, that's the money, the money part's a big thing. And it's a, people are very nervous to speak about that. Another thing that, that men um, secrets is they, they pretend, like they pretend to be interested in what you're interested in because they want to bond. They don't want to feel that rejection. They don't want to be wronged. Um, and they also want to be intimate as well. Not just sexually intimate. They want to connect emotionally as well. It's a fallacy that men only want sex. Men do want sex. So research has been done on this. One of the top two things that men want is more sex. But the, the sex is a gateway to something else. It's to intimacy, connection, to be seen, to be accepted, to be appreciated, to be re, uh, respected deeply. So it, it's more than just that. So, you know, early on in a relationship, men will do this, they'll pretend, but then later they turn into their quote unquote true selves. But that's also part of the limerence phase, that honeymoon period where you have a co hormonal concoction of many different hormones moving through your body. And all you're seeing is this polarized version of the other person and of yourself. And so we're always putting our best foot forward, right? Men also keep, um, they keep secrets about previous relationships. And this is largely because they don't want to be judged, particularly if they've done things in the past that they're not proud of, or if they've had unsuccessful relationships because they equate that to them being failures, even though, you know, people break up all the time. There's, you know, reason, season, lifetime that we're together in any type of relationship. So it's, they have this, this aversion to speaking um, about that. And then finally, I would say men hide their emotions. Um, and because they hide their emotions, they, they secretly feel depressed and lonely. They feel isolated. So they pretend, they put this false bravado on this confidence that they feel good and they've got it all together, but really they're, they're hurting inside. And they don't want to present that on, on, on first dates or when they first meet a woman because they then think that they're going to be perceived as weak or not enough or not seen with great reverence and respected and appreciated. So there's some of the, some of the things that men would hide in, at the beginning of a relationship and why. So when you talk about the <clears throat> emotional aspect um, or the lack of emotional regulation with depression and those types of things, I'm wondering what you can say to this because sometimes I'll often see with the narcissistic type personality, addictions will come into play to kind of have those numbing agents, um, in particular like gambling, sex addiction, um, you know, substance and, and alcohol. I'm wondering what you see with the men that you work with that would fit that type of um, narcissistic, would that be part of some of the secrets that they keep? Oh, absolutely. Any compulsions, any addictions that they have, anything that's extreme that doesn't put them in good favor, such as alcohol addictions, drug addictions, gambling, sex, pornography, a masturbation, um, uh, even even a, a, le a, a leaning into high risk behavior, whatever that may be. Um, it could even be crime to some extent. Um, they'll definitely hide that for sure. So then when we look at, um, we'll call them narcs. <laughs> so when, uh, narcs yeah. want to control everything. And sometimes what I'll see, it's hard for them to, a, a narcissistic or a narc, hard for them to trust an actual loyal person and especially because of their own past relationships and in your opinion like why would that be if someone's listening to this and they know that they're loyal and because what i'll hear from some of my women stuff is that they know that they've been loyal they they are falling into that people pleasing codependent i do everything for him but yet i feel like i'm explaining myself for being distrustworthy and when i'm really a loyal trustworthy person well Knox, they're actually very vulnerable they're quote unquote weak. I don't like to use that. But there's a weakness in their, in their psychological, emotional constitution. And so they, they really suffer from profound, they experience alienation, isolation, emptiness, power. They feel powerless most of the time. That's why they're in this manipulative control often. They lack meaning in their lives. They, they really assign their meaning through vicariously through others that they admire and so forth. And so there's extreme vulnerability there. Um, and because of that, they, they crave power and they trust no one. Um, and they want to control everything and everyone in their environment and their own feelings. They want to control their own feelings. They want to control the feelings of others, how others see them. Um, and displaying, first of all, displaying any vulnerable feelings such as shame, sadness, um, fear, 
that's already difficult for men because of cultural and even biological conditioning. So we very quickly move to secondary emotions such as anger to mask those intense feelings. Again, evolutionary reasons for this, cultural reasons for this. So someone that's a narc, it's, that's even amplified more so. And so their defense mechanism is, well, I'm just going to hurt others. or I'm going to pretend to be this person. Uh, but that's obviously not sustainable for most people in a relationship. So then with that being said, then, then why do women think that they can change a man that they are dating or choose to marry after cleaning, laundry, cooking, sexing him, you know, all that stuff. And they feel like they've become, I call it, they get into performance and auditioning ro roles. So they're performing and auditioning, trying to get that love, kind of get that love, but then the man still isn't faithful. So I kind of always get this question and um, I'm sure the women want to know from a male perspective, I mean, why that is, why does that still occur? For, for women, why that still occurs for women? Right, that they would, that the yeah. man would still be unfaithful to them. Oh, well, because he's not connected to himself. So the man's continuing to behave in any and every way he wants because that woman is lacking low self, uh, low, that woman is lacking high self-worth and is carrying low self-worth and basically believes that I'm not going to get any better, so I'm just going to keep staying here. So she's enabling that behavior. Now, it's not her fault. He's responsible for his actions, but it's for him in his mind. It's like, well, why should I change? She's just going to keep doing all these things for me. She's going to keep being here and I get to live my life how I want. I'm not going to look at my stuff. My life is made. And it's that type of attitude, complete disregard for the woman, complete disregard for the amazing things that she does for him. And those amazing things that she does for him are also coming from a place of hurt and pain and unresolved um, fears and wounding. And so it's, we have to do our own deeper inner work and get really clear on, hey, this is who I am and I, I deserve more. I'm not going to tolerate this. Because you know, you know that, old, that, that old saying, you, know, you don't know what it's got until, you don't know what you have until it's gone. You don't know what you've got until it's gone. And if that woman isn't stepping into her power and owning what she deserves, that person's just going to keep doing that because it serves him. It's easy. Why wouldn't he? He's, he's all about short-term gratification and short-term pleasure. He's not evolved in his being. He's not interested in what we spoke about before, reciprocal reverence. That's not where he's at. He's in that stage one, hyper-selfish, what can I get from the relationship? So what comes to mind as you um, draw out that example is almost as if the, let's call it the empath, the codependent, the people pleaser, um, can also enable some of that if she's in that performance. Um, I'm auditioning for his love and I'm going to yep. try to sex him enough, cook him enough, try to do all these things and, and just keep doing more and more and more until she completely depletes herself. And I know another common um, question that I'll get from, from women in particular, you know, if we kind of use the narcissistic terminology, the supply, right? He's getting his supply from her. He's getting the admiration, all that stuff he feels in control. And then in the unfaithfulness, he finds new supply, um, the new, you know, as you look at the limbic system and, and, and all that stuff that's happening and she doesn't yet, yet know him. Um, but what happens when what I'll hear is like, they'll ask, well, why does he come back? So he'll go away, you know, and get his new supply or whatever that may be, but he'll eventually come back to me um, in particular is what I'll hear from the females. Could you speak to that so that the females who are listening can get the knowledge that they need as to why a narcissist will come back if his uh, new supplies and living up to his expectations? He's coming back because you're familiar. He's coming back because you're safe. He's coming back because he needs his ego stroked and he knows he has social proof and he has a historical analysis of proof in his mind, memory that you can do that for him. It's safe in the sense that he knows he can be, he can push the edges, he's had that experience, he can gain dominance, he can feel back in power again. And that's an easy win for him. It's an, because in a narcissist's mind, it's sometimes it's really simple. It's wins and losses. It's as simple as that. Am I winning? No. What can I do to win? I'm going to go back to what's familiar. I'm going to go back to what I'm accustomed to. I'm going to go back to what I know where I can get that dopamine hit. And also after being away for a while, it's novelty again. You know, you, you, if we just get honest with ourselves for a moment, we've been in relationships and then after a while, after a number of months or years, that relationship, it's not novel anymore. And then we break up and then we find ourselves sometimes later 
a month, a few months, a few weeks, thinking about that person and becoming aroused, whether it's emotionally aroused, sexually aroused, because there's a novelty there because there's been a big space and break and there's also other elements to that. But part of it is because there's almost novelty again in that. And so that narc will just cycle and cycle and cycle and keep getting those hits because not only is there novelty, but there's some guarantee there, or at least in his mind, because he's had an experience with that person before. So there's familiarity there and he knows how to manipulate the situation. So then with the, um, the female codependent or the female empath or the female victim in the relationship, we can use those words interchangeably, you know, part of that. And we were just talking during the break around your inner child, um, workshop is them also understanding that familiarity. So that, that narc who are, who's that, who are they recreating in that relationship? Whether it's the absent father, whether it's the mom who was in the home, but she wasn't. Cause I always say that sometimes women are also trying to find their nurture of their mother or the lack of in the bed with men. So I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about that. No, you're getting ready to have um, some workshops around inner child. How could, what, what could you say to a female about her inner work and what she's chasing? Because what will happen is sometimes females will know cognitively, okay, this is not healthy, but yet we'll still chase. I, it's like the back walking away. And when he's, when he's pulling away, she's chasing and she's going after him. I mean, what are some of the key things to kind of kick their mindset to think about what they need to heal when it comes to that recreation of potential trauma in their history? So we're talking about, you know, aspects of healing the inner child. And we, we have to go back to learning how to reparent ourselves. Um, because otherwise what we're doing is we're, we're, we have this unconscious expectation around, oh, I need my parents to solve my problem for me. Or I need to, the only way I'm going to feel better about myself is through how my parents see me. So learning to reparent ourselves is very, very important. When we're talking about healing the inner child, it's learning to be playful again. It's learning to love ourselves in, in, in kindness and compassion. It's surrounding ourselves with people that support our dreams and allow us to dream big, that don't shame us. It's making peace with our past by feeling those big feelings in a supported way. It's not making us making ourselves wrong for the choices that we've made in our lives, but rather choosing to learn from them. And this is part of healing the inner child. And if you have children, it's, you know, loving that children, loving your children, loving those children, the way that you weren't. It's also going through a process of primal release. And what that means is sometimes it's not about understanding our feelings. It's not even having to understand the mother wound or the father wound which aren't formal diagnoses, but it's just, it's, it's, it's just releasing. It's primal screaming. It's hitting pillows. It's, it's moving, moving our bodies. It's getting out of the mind a great deal. And this is, and this, you know, the inner child work and, and trauma is part of that. So how do we heal from trauma? We develop emotional resilience and toughness by moving through different challenges and overcoming those micro and macro challenges. It's appreciating our bodies at a deeper level. It's reframing our limiting beliefs. It's beginning to believe, just beginning to believe in real love, authentic love and intimacy. So where can we be intimate with ourselves? It's exploring the world with wonder and curiosity, which is what you mentioned earlier. It's forgiving ourselves. But again, before we forgive, we have to feel the unfelt feelings that were, uh, that were experienced um, during particular times in our lives that we've, we've neglected. We surround ourselves with people that we trust, respect, and revere. So we have a real sense of, oh, I can trust another human being. There's, I mean, there's so much to this, Jenny. I don't, <laughs> I can get going on and on about this. No, it's, it's perfect. Because I think it's exactly what, what people need to hear. But I want to pull out a few nuggets of that is that to heal is not just a cognitive process. We store mm -hmm. trauma in our body. There has to be mm -hmm. a, either a somatic experience. There has to be, you know, polyvagal. There's all different types of things that people can do to get in their body. And you were mentioning some physical things, you know, and, you know, I brought our women redeemed group to the rate. We're actually we're getting ready to go to the rage room. Right. So mm -hmm. we've done Absolutely. some done some work around um, healing some of their inner child. And then we're specifically identifying different parts of that. And then we're going to the rage room to release some of those things um, physically, because what will happen and you're speaking to this is that if we do not heal or females do not heal, you know, they may have been with John, but now they're going to find Charles who they're going to realize that I thought I left John behind, but Charles is going to be another John. If we're going to continue that repetitive cycle. Mm. 
Yep. So, so, so then with that being said, if you could just say a few things, I think this goes right into um, healthy relationships because I believe that if women in particular don't know, they haven't seen it in their own family or they haven't experienced it, they can be educated and learn a few pillars of what a healthy relationship would look like. So when they're moving forward in their own healing, this is kind of the measurement. If this doesn't line up with what I know, even though I haven't experienced it, what could you say as far as some healthy elements to what a healthy relationship should look like when she's healing and moving out of that narcissistic uh, repetitive cycle and she wants to move more towards a healthier relationship? Yeah, you're looking for, so what, so essentially, I suppose what you're asking is what, it, what does a, a woman look for in a man or in herself or both? In a man, a healthy relationship with a man. We're looking at heterosexual relationships. Yeah, of course, of course. So looking at a man, seeing, looking at his friends, does he have long-term friends? Has he got intimate connections with other women as well at a friendship level? That's really important, just at a platonic level. Has he got healthy, does he carry healthy routines? Does he look after his physical body? This displays levels of confidence and resilience and reliability and trust in his own body as well, that he can go through difficulty that he's willing. Does he carry willingness, a sense of willingness to want to work through difficult, um, difficult situations if they, if they come to him? Is he, is he clear on who he is as a man? Has he got clarity on his purpose and his vision? Is he a giving person? Is he able to receive? These are important elements as well. We're talking about, you know, we're talking about a, a, an awakened man, a healthy man, because that, that wounded man fears the unknown. That wounded man is, is spoiled, is disregarding, he's careless, he's not considerate. So consideration is the man that you're looking, is he considerate, is he compassionate? But is he also, I don't want to use the word stoic, but is he, is he patient and responsive to life, not reactive? Is a man clear in his commitments? Because, you know, we have that Peter Pan man as well, that non-committal man that just keeps floating around and it fears commitment. We have those men that are dominate, dominating, and scrutinizing and demanding. So is your man more open-minded and open-hearted, not rigid in who he is, believes in his ideals, holds his ideals true, knows who he is, can carry articulate conversation in various uh, areas of life. And that's, that's someone that is well informed, but he's not completely rigid to those areas. You, know, you look for a man that is considerate, look for a man that is consistent in his behavior, that is reliable, that carries integrity, what he says he does. These are important things to look for. Look for a man that doesn't play games. Now, there's nothing wrong with playing that game when you first date. I'm not talking about that game of that sort of cat and mouse. I'm talking about the game where a man is manipulating a situation and not getting back to a woman because he wants her to get back to him because he wants to feel better about himself and he's testing how much she cares for him and so forth. That's their games. We don't need those. Well, I believe if there was a assembly line and those men were made, that company would be making a lot of money, Steph. <laughs> <laughs> Many men out there, there's many great men out there in that way. I can tell you that. Absolutely. So as we get ready to, to close um, down, I'm wondering um, how people could reach you or if there's anything that you have going on, if they want to follow or work with you. Of course, uh, growwithsteph.com is a great place to start. So S-T-E-F, growwithsteph.com. And you'll have access to my main website there, but there's a heap of free, free freebies there for you as well. Uh, mini breathwork courses, a love, a love block assessment to understand why you may be experiencing love blocks in your life and anywhere on social media at Stephanos Safandos. Well, thank you so much, Steph. Um, I certainly appreciate you being here and your uh, friendship and all of the work that you do in our healing community. So we just hope that this show has inspired you to look in the mirror and take an inventory of your relationships. You wanna make you your number one priority because narcissistic people will try to pull you into only focusing primarily on their needs. So think about what your life goals and aspirations are and become laser focused on them. Remember that words must be backed by action and stay in reality. So you know when the smoke screen appears, are you getting your needs met? Reciprocated relationships is a must. No more one-sided relationships. So until next time, this is your host, Janie Lacey. Thanks. 
Thank you for tuning in. Let's Talk About It can be heard live every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific Time and 8 p.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Empowerment Channel. Please join your host, Dr. Janie Lacey, for another edition of the show next week.